Um, again, I'm a pediatric dermatologist at Nationwide Children's Hospital in uh, Columbus, Ohio. And uh, so we're going to be talking about the skin part, the birthmark uh, part. So just to give you a bit of a, a roadmap of what we're going to talk about, is we're going to talk a little bit about what is the port wine birthmark, um, how do we treat this, this type of, of birthmarks, and a little bit of what the Surgery Weber Foundation Dermatology Task Force is, is working on. Now, I, you know, as, as I mentioned before, I really have to say that you guys are the experts um, on this. So I really, really hope to hear from you, to learn from you what has been your experience, to learn from you what is it that you uh, that you care the most about, what is it that you want us to look for, to study, uh, what is it that you want us that you want us to provide more education or or to do more research. And I think this is this is very important. You know, again, I think we we all learn together. Um, we learn a lot from from your experience, or from what you have gone through. So, it it is very important to to hear you and to you know I, I hope that uh, many of you can share uh, your thoughts and your experience. Um, and you know, for for most of you, most of what I'm going to talk about is is information that you already know, right? You you are the experts. Um, but just to kind of uh, keep everyone at the same at the same uh, level, I'm going to go through some information that maybe you are already familiar with. So let's start with what is a port wine birthmark. So a port wine birthmark is a vascular type of birthmark made up of, of dilated blood vessels, probably the smallest blood vessels in the skin. And so it is considered a form of capillary malformation. So it is considered a birthmark that is made up of uh, dilated capillary vessels, although we know that it's not just capillary vessels. There are other types of vessels that are uh, involved uh, as well. We know there are some specific genetics that are associated with this, uh, with the birthmark. The most commonly known one is the GNAQ. You might have heard about it, but there are other ones like GNA11, for example. Now, the, the genetics um, happens, the genetic mutations happens in patients who have the birthmark only or who have Stuch Weber syndrome. So unfortunately, the genetic test does not tell us whether a patient who may not have other symptoms, but uh, uh, when we see them, they might only uh, be presented with a birthmark. We cannot do the genetic testing to tell whether they have Stuch Weber syndrome or not. So it, it is it is present in both in both scenarios. Um, an important part of the birthmark, and one of the reasons why treatment can sometimes be a little bit difficult, and one of the reasons why the birthmark might look different in different people, is that the blood vessels can have different sizes. So maybe there's some smaller ones on the top, there's some uh, bigger ones uh, on, on the deeper levels. Uh, some are mostly superficial, in other patients a combination of superficial and deep. And so that gives us a different, a bit of a different look to the birthmark and also some um, issues with, with getting this birthmark to, to respond to treatment as, as we would like them to. There are many names and many terms that are used and have been used, and you will see uh, to describe this, this type of birthmark. So the, the one that we prefer to use is a port wine birthmark. Uh, another one is port wine stain, although we don't like that term as much. Um, it is a capillary malformation, so it is in that kind of big umbrella uh, group. Nevus flamus is another term that you might have read about or you might have seen. It all basically means the same, port wine birthmark. Now we can see this type of birthmark really anywhere on the body, although most commonly we see it on the head and neck and definitely with uh, patients with Stuch Weber syndrome, this is gonna be the most critical uh, place where we are going to see it, but really it can happen anywhere um, on the body. Now having a port wine birthmark does not mean that a patient um, has a Stuch Weber syndrome or that is at risk. We have learned a lot more about which are the, the places, which are the distributions of the birthmark that actually put the patient at risk for Stuart Weber. Um, and what we know, so what I'm showing here is, is a cartoon of the three main kind of patterns or three main distributions of the port wine birthmark that are associated with Stuart Weber. And what all of these three have in common is that they all involve the forehead. And so whenever we see a patient with a port wine birthmark on the forehead, those are the patients that we start to think, hmm, could this patient have Scrooge Weber syndrome if they don't have any other, any other symptoms? So for example, having a port wine birthmark on the arm, that doesn't really uh, place the patient in a, a, at risk for, for Scrooge Weber. So it has to be some specific locations and on the face, particularly on the, on the forehead. Um, 
And this is just uh, to show you, I don't, I, I know I don't have to show you this, but different examples of different patients with different types of a port wine birthmark. Um, what I want to show here is that the color can be different in different patients. Uh, it depends a lot on how much of that, you know, those blood vessels are concentrated in the skin. It depends a lot also on the background skin color. So it might be a little bit less noticeable in patients with darker skin, but it ranges from a light pink to a dark red or even that kind of more purple color. Um, and that's, that's where the term port wine uh, comes from because this can darken with time, which we'll talk a little bit about um, next. So one of the big questions that parents have for us is, well, what's going to happen over time? Is, it, is the birthmark going to stay the same? Is it going to change in the future? So we know that for many patients, the birthmark does become darker. So it becomes more red or even purple. And again, that's where the term port wine comes from because it can, can get a, a kind of like a deep red or deep purple color like port wine. Um, in some patients, the skin may get thicker um, or they may have this kind of blebs or little vascular papules or nodules. So these little um, bumps, vascular bumps that develop over the skin. Um, this can be super, super viable. And the other um, issue that we see in many patients is the soft tissue overgrowth. So it's not only the skin, but the soft tissue is kind of all the tissues under the skin uh, that can get bigger. So it's the fat layers of the skin or even the bone can have some overgrowth um, as well. Now, this is very, very viable. It's usually something that takes years. So it's not something that happens quickly, but happens yeah. over. Uh, you talk to a neurosurgeon. I talk because more. Uh, it, it's usually something that happens over over years and can be very difficult to predict. Uh, when when we're seeing a baby or a young infant with this type of birthmark, it's difficult to predict what is going to happen um, in the in the future. Now, let's talk a little bit about treatment. And what I'm showing here is a photo of uh, myself doing a laser treatment for a patient with a port wine uh, birthmark on the face, and this is particularly the pulse eye laser. Of course, this is a vascular birthmark, so we're gonna use a vascular laser. This is what we're gonna use the most, and there are different types of vascular lasers. We have the pulse eye laser, but there's also alexandrite, diode laser, NDAG laser, and there are other forms of light treatments, particularly intense pulse light, or IPL, which is not exactly a laser, but it can be used similar to the way we use lasers. Now, of all of this, the one that's really first-line treatment um, option, the standard of care for port wing birthmarks is the pulse eye laser. So this is the laser for which we have the most evidence, not only with regards to um, efficacy, but very, very, very importantly, the evidence on safety um, to use for patients who have a port wing birthmark. So pulse eye laser is typically our first-line treatment option. The other lasers, particularly you know, the Alexandrite laser or the NDAC laser, those are lasers that go much deeper into the skin and could potentially have uh, more issues as far as, as safety, meaning they can cause more blisters or a higher risk of scarring. But these are lasers that can be used as patients get older. If the birthmark becomes thicker, uh, they develop the thickening of the skin or the blebs and nodules. We know those are deeper, so we can use this, these lasers that, that go deeper. Um, into the skin. But in general, pulse day laser is going to be our, our first line. Now, when we're talking to parents um, about poor, um, laser treatments, uh, there's a lot of questions that, that, we, that we cover and a lot of questions that, that, that parents have or some questions that maybe they have not thought about and, and that, that we cover. One is, why? Why are we treating the, their birthmark? Uh, when do we treat it? At what age do we treat it? And how often? What can we expect from the, from the laser treatments? Um, how many treatments? That's a big, big question. How many treatments um, are we going to need to do? And um, unfortunately, laser treatments are painful. They're, they're pretty uncomfortable. Um, and of course, we're treating mostly on the face, which is a very sensitive area of the body. So not, not the most comfortable thing to do. So how do we make it more comfortable, especially in little ones who may not really have, a, have much of a say in, in what we're doing? So let's start with why. Um, and, and this is something that I would love to hear you know, from the parents in the, in, the, in the group. I would love to hear your experience, but I am a father myself. I have 10-year-old uh, twins. And I think we as parents, we can develop a sense of guilt very, very easily, right? And so very often I, I gather from the parents when they come in to discuss laser treatments, 
that they almost have a sense of guilt that they might be considering doing a laser treatment for what they have been told is a cosmetic procedure. And, I, and I, I'm very open with them and I tell them, I am not doing this because this is a cosmetic procedure, especially when we're treating you know, babies or, or, or little kids, your baby's already beautiful. We're not making your baby more beautiful, right? This is not a rejuvenation type of treatment. We're really treating their birthmark for the psychosocial development of um, our kids, of our patients. They might not care when they are an infant or a two-year-old or a three-year-old, but as they get older, they become more aware of their, of their birthmark and that they have it and others might not have it. So it might be an issue with uh, social interactions. It might be an issue with school. So we really do it from a psychosocial development um, standpoint. Um, so that, 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 that's the point that, that I like to make with, with my parents so that they you know, maybe hopefully get that field sensation um, out, of, out of the way. The other two main reasons that we do it, um, of course, we want to make that birthmark lighter. Uh, we, we want to make it kind of fade away and uh, blend in with the rest of the skin a little bit better. But we want also to do the lasers to prevent some of those potential complications or potential uh, changes in the future. So we want to prevent that darkening that could happen in the future. We want to prevent that thickening that may happen in the future. And while we don't have great, great evidence to support this, we do have some evidence to say that if we do these laser treatments earlier on, we might be able to prevent some of those changes um, to happen in the, in the future. When and how often? Um, the earlier in general, the earlier we start the treatments, the better the response. So if we start the treatments when babies are, are little or when kids are little, um, we can get to those blood vessels a little bit better because their skin is a little bit, um, a little bit thinner. Also, they have not seen as much sun um, as we have as, as, as adults. And so to do it on lighter skin tends to work much better um, as well. So there are other reasons why early treatments tend to work uh, better. So that's, that's in general the, the recommendation. And how often? It's variable. It could be done every four weeks, every eight weeks. Some, uh, for some patients, we do it um, a little bit more, more often. It depends a lot of, of when we're doing it and how we're doing it. Are we doing this in clinic without sedation? Are we doing this under sedation? So, so those are all factors that we take into, um, into consideration. Now, the other um, thing that I talked to the parents, do we have to treat it? No, I mean, that is a decision that we, that we, that we uh, make together. Even though we know that lasers can improve the birthmark, even though we know that early treatments can be very helpful, not everyone decides to treat their birthmark. And I think that is, that is very, very, uh, very acceptable as well. So it does not need to be treated necessarily. What to expect after the laser? So what I tell parents, especially if they have not undergone any treatments, I tell them, well, the first time we do the laser or every time we do the laser, it's going to look worse. The birth is going to look worse because we want with the laser is to create some bruising. We want to kind of burst those blood vessels that are uh, making that birthmark red or pink. And we want to, uh, we're going to be creating some bruising. Sometimes there's some swelling, not often. That happens most of the time when we're treating around the eyes. Uh, the skin around the eyes is, is thinner, so there might be some, some swelling. And then that bruise fades away somewhere between 10 and 14 days, and some patients is a little bit um, sooner, um, but 14 days is typically the, the max that it, would, that it would take for that bruising to go away. And what we expect is as the bruise goes away, then there's going to be some lightening of the, of the birthmark. It's a slow process. So unfortunately, lasers are not magic erasers, and we cannot get rid of the birthmark completely. If we can get to a lightning of 50, 70%, that's a pretty good response. Some patients are fortunate that we can get a really, really good, it looks like almost, it has been erased, but I would say in the majority of patients, we, we cannot get to that point. And our best, um, our, our best responses are to make it lighter, to make it fainter. Uh, this is an example of a patient with a port wine birthmark uh, right after laser, so as you can see, it has been, uh, it, looks, it looks darker, it looks bruised. That, that's what we want with, with the laser. I'm sure uh, for those of you who have had uh, laser treatment, you know exactly what I'm, what I'm talking about. The, the other important thing is even though it, it looks like it's, it's painful afterwards, most of the time for most patients, at least in, in most of my pediatric patients, they don't tend to, to complain too much about, about pain. Might feel like a, a, uh, more like a, like a sunburn, um, if anything, but most patients go about their normal activities uh, without any problems. There are some areas of the body that tend to be more resistant. So there are some areas where we have a lot of a harder time uh, clearing up those, those birthmarks. So for some reason, this part of the, of the cheek, kind of the, the central cheek or um, 
uh, kind of close, close to the nose area. This is an area that tends to be very stubborn. Also, if we're treating the birthmarks that are on the arms or the legs, the further down we go towards the hand, the further down we go towards the, the feet, uh, they tend to be much more stubborn and we have a harder time clearing those, those birth, birthmarks on those locations. So it's also important to know that um, while lasers can be very helpful, different parts of the birthmark might respond differently depending on where that birthmark is. And this is just to show you an example of a patient that I treated several years ago with a, a port wine birthmark on the face. And as you can see, if you look at the, at the side of the cheek, kind of going towards the ear, this cleared up really nicely. It, it lightened up pretty nicely, but the center of the cheek, it, it, it persisted a lot more. It did not respond quite as well as the side of the face, which is fairly typical for port wine birthmarks on the face. We don't quite understand exactly why, uh, we need a better understanding of why that happens so we can find better treatment options for patients who have a birthmark on that um, on that location. How many treatments? This is a big, big question. Um, it is very, very viable. What I typically tell parents, well, we'll start with five or six treatments, kind of a handful of treatments, and then go from there. But it is not uncommon for patients with birthmark, uh, for when birthmark, especially in the face, to require 10, 20, 30, even more treatments. So that is not that is not unusual. And we get to a point that we do what we call touch-up treatments. We know we are not making the birthmark uh, go away completely. We're not completely erasing the birthmark. Uh, hopefully we'll get there someday, uh, but we know those blood vessels start to kind of come back. And so very often, even after we, we've gotten a really good response, we, we um, often need to do some touch-up treatments once a year, twice a year to maintain uh, the effect as the birthmark um, starts to come back. Now, how about the pain and the discomfort associated with the, with the laser? I mentioned lasers are uncomfortable and uh, many of you who have experienced lasers uh, can, can attest to that. Um, so it's a, it's a big question, especially when we're dealing with um, a baby, when we're dealing with a, a toddler or you know, a child who may not have much of a say and we're making that decision for them. Uh, are these procedures that we can do in clinic? Do we need to do sedation? And there's pros and cons to each one of these of this decisions. Uh, one of the, the biggest factors that we have to take into consideration, especially with sedation, is that we know that the FDA um, uh, published a, a warning several years ago saying that for patients who are three years of age and younger, if they have to undergo multiple episodes of uh, sedation, they might be at higher risk of some learning difficulties in the, in the future. Now, they did not specifically um, study patients who were undergoing laser treatments. Fortunately, the laser treatments are very, very, uh, are fairly fast. Uh, so patients are not under sedation for a long time. But this is a one of those factors that we discuss with the, with the parents as well, and and you know again I I really don't think here that you know we have to go one one way um, or the other right I really don't think that one size fits all. Uh, it really is a team decision, and and by team I mean all of us, um, the parents, the patient, if the patient can can share their their opinion as well, um, and us. I think it's a, it's what we call shared decision making. We provide the information that. That we have, we discuss what are the risks, what are the benefits of doing it one way or the other. If we decide to do it in clinic, we'll often do it when uh, babies are very, very little and they will not, will be less likely to remember that they underwent something that was uh, painful. We do different things to make it as as comfortable um, as possible. But again, this is this is a, a shared decision uh, with the parents, with the patient, when they're a little bit older on how to treat it. Some parents are very comfortable with doing the procedures in clinic. Some parents are not comfortable with doing the procedure in clinic and they, uh, and they prefer to do things under, under sedation. The other um, scenario that we take advantage of is if a patient might need uh, an eye exam under sedation or if they need an MRI. So we'll often take advantage of that opportunity and then you know, slide in a, a laser treatment during that time. So we take advantage of one sedation um, episode to do the laser treatment as well. What are the risks of particular pulse dye laser? Um, you know, overall, it's a very safe laser to use. And again, is the um, standard of care for patients with port wine birthmarks. We know there's gonna be bruising. That is almost 100% guaranteed. We actually like to see that bruising because that tells us that we are targeting those blood vessels and making those blood vessels um, kind of go away. Swelling doesn't always happen. It, it's it's uh, variable depending on where we're doing it. Some patients may uh, experience some darkening or lightening of their, of their skin. 
This happens mostly in patients who have a little bit more pigment in their skin. They have a little bit darker skin types. Uh, so th that may happen um, for them. Blistering and crusting is not something that we love to see, um, but that could potentially happen as well. The really good thing about the pulse eye laser is, it, is that it has a very, very low risk of scarring. So only patients who really develop blistering and crusting and maybe they get a, an infection um, because the skin is, is open, those might be patients who might be at high risk for scarring. But one of the good things about the pulse eye laser is that that risk of scar is very, very low. With the other lasers, that risk goes a little bit higher. Eye protection is a really, really important part um, of laser treatments. And depending on what, uh, what part of the phase we're treating, whether we're treating in the clinic or under sedation, then we use different types of, um, of eye protection uh, methods. How do we prepare patients for laser treatments? What are some important points to consider? One is sun protection. So the lighter the skin can be, the better the laser is going to target the blood vessels instead of targeting the pigment on the skin. So sun protection before and after. So before the laser treatment and while the skin is healing is going to be um, ideal. We want the skin to be as fair and light as possible. The lasers are going to work much better um, in, those, in those cases. Uh, we ask patients not to apply moisturizer or sunscreen or topical medications the day of the, of the treatment. So it doesn't mean there's no interactions with the, um, with the laser. And after the laser, we ask patients to keep their, uh, the treated area just very well lubricated, clean and well lubricated. Usually we recommend Vaseline or Aquaphor or a petrolatum based type of, of moisturizer. And of course, very well protected from the sun um, as well. Now, most, and I would love to hear um, from your experience, what, 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 do you, what do you have sense after, after laser treatments? In most, uh, I, my patient population is primarily pediatric patients. We do treat some adults, right. but mostly pediatric patients. Um, usually they don't have a lot of discomfort. They don't have a lot of pain um, after the treatment. They go about their normal activities like, like nothing happened. And it, it looks bruised and it looks like it's painful, but they're, they're usually very comfortable. But different measures that we recommend, some cold compressors can help with some discomfort. Um, keeping the moisturizer um, cold in the fridge can help so that when it is applied, it feels better. Occasionally, patients might need some uh, Tylenol or Motrin, but again, most of the time, it's not, um, it's not needed. Most patients don't need uh, this, this type of, of medication. It is important to consider the activities around the laser treatment. So, um, sometimes we ask the patients, well, it might not be a great idea to go swimming until the bruise goes away. This is most important when there is an open story. If there's any blistering, there's crusting, we want to prevent an infection. So swimming might be a little bit limited. Same with contact sports. The skin is going to be a little bit tender. It's, it's still healing. So if a ball hits, hits you on the face where the, the, um, the birthmark was treated, then that might cause uh, an open sore or issues with the, with the healing part. Outdoor activities, uh, mostly from the sun exposure standpoint, it's not that we want kids to stay indoors all the time, but if they're gonna go outside, be a little bit more, um, uh, be using sun protection a little bit uh, a little bit more, a hat, a baseball cap, and sunscreen is gonna be very important. And it also always tell uh, the parents, well, we don't wanna do this around important uh, family events. If there is time for family photos or school photos or uh, for adults, we have to consider their work um, environment and their, and their work life because we know it's going to look worse, it's going to look bruised, it's going to uh, be more, more prominent. So we want to be also very um, sensitive about the patient's social activities and everything else that's, that's uh, going on in their, in their life. What is the future of Port Wine birthmarks looking like? Um, so uh, there's some studies looking at different imaging technologies. One of the issues that I mentioned before is that we can see what's on the skin, but we have a hard time knowing what's under the skin, meaning what is the size of those blood vessels? How deep are they going? Are they all superficial? Are there some deeper ones? Depending on all of those uh, factors, we can decide, well, maybe then we need to use a laser that goes deeper, or maybe we need to switch or change the settings of the laser so we can get a better response. And so there's studies looking at different ways to look very kind of microscopically under the skin um, and look at what those blood vessels look like. Hopefully we'll, we'll get better laser technologies, laser technologies that will um, allow us to better clear or to lighten 
those uh, birthmarks um, a little bit better or faster. And the other, the other part that's, that has, uh, there are several studies going on, uh, is what we call adjuvant therapies, meaning can we use a cream that would help to, along with the laser, to clear up that birthmark a little bit better or a little bit faster. So there, there's different studies looking into how can we, um, how can we develop a, be a better treatment for our patients with Fort Wayne birthmarks. Um, just to finish up, let me tell you what is, what's been going on with uh, specifically the Dermatology Task Force of the Swiss River Foundation. One, a, a very important goal of ours is education um, and not only education to, to the family, to the parents, to the patients, but very importantly, we've been focused on provider education, particularly education for primary care providers, for pediatricians. They are going to be, you know, our first line. You know, they are going to be the first ones that are going to see um, our babies, our patients with uh, with the birthmark. And and uh, I th we think that it is very very important to educate them on which birthmarks, which patients might need more urgent referrals, more urgent um, evaluations um, if they encounter a patient with a Fort Wayne birthmark. Um, the other two uh, kind of main, main um, tasks that we are dealing with is uh, to try to understand better what is the role of hormones in patients with Sturge Weber syndrome. We know with other types of vascular birthmarks or what we call vascular anomalies, those can respond a lot or, for example, get worse during uh, some hormonal changes in life. And that's something that we want to better understand in patients with Sturge Weber syndrome, meaning do things get, do symptoms get worse during adolescence or during pregnancy? Do things get worse during a hormonal type of treatment? So that is something that we're very interested in, in understanding better. So we are um, uh, planning to do a survey and, and, and send it to all of you guys so, so we can learn from you and see if that's something that you have, that you have experienced. And the other big part is how to better measure the treatment response. Right now, the way we measure a treatment response is we take before and after pictures. And so we take serial pictures and look at the pictures and see, see whether it looks better or not, if it looks lighter or not. But there aren't any really good um, objective ways to measure it. So as we um, have better studies and do more studies of treatment options for, for patients with Fort Wayne birthmarks, it is very important to know exactly how to, how to measure that response. So, and with that, I thank you, and uh, I would love to hear from you guys, see what you guys have to 